You may be seated. If you got your Bibles today, you can turn to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be there the remainder of our service, and uh, I know the guy's going to speak through his word today. And so my title today is Seeking the Lost, Seeking the Lost. And uh, we, we had a great week at youth camp, and, and I took uh, some of the thoughts from, uh, from that week and kind of summed them up, and, um, and, this, and so we came up with the message today of Seeking the Lost. Um, and, the, and, the, and the whole theme of the week was hope, the hope that we have in Christ. And so we're going to be talking about that hope that we have in Christ. Um, have you ever lost something? Have you ever lost something? And it's kind of frustrating when you lose something. Uh, but in my house, we have the, what I like to call the remote wars. And, uh, and, and so my girls, and as soon as Mac will learn this as well, have found out that there is power and holding the remote, right? You know, there's power in having and holding the remote. And they know, they know that if they have the remote in their hand, that they could turn the channel if they don't like it. They know that they can, they can decide what is being played. And so they, there's all time battles going on about who has the remote. But what they have also learned is that if they ever have to go somewhere and do something, um, they, they have this new feature on, on uh, 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 Netflix and Hulu that we have, is that you can pause the movie. So they'll pause that movie, and they'll take that remote with them wherever they go and leave you hanging. Like, they'll leave, if they need to go get a drink or they need to go upstairs or whatever, uh, they will pause that show and then go do whatever they got to do. Um, and if they're by themselves, they'll pause it and hide the remote. All right, that's what they'll hide it somewhere. And then, and, and like what happens with kids a lot of times, they get distracted. So they'll go and do whatever they need to do, clean their room or, or pick up something. And, 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 and then they will forget where they put the remote. That leaves me in a little quandary later on. Because later on that evening, we'll, we'll sit down to have, watch a family movie. And we're like, where, where's the remote? We can't turn the TV on. We don't know where the remote's at. Um, and so we have these remote wars. I remember uh, one time uh, Mac got a hold of it, and he didn't know what it was. He was playing with it, and he put it in one of his little toy trucks. Three days later, we found this thing, guys. Three days later. Uh, you know, in those moments, you, you get kind of anxious. You, get, you just get kind of frustrated, and a lot of times you, you just lose, you lose track of why you're even looking for it. You, I just want to find this thing that I'm looking for because it's on my mind. I, you know, I just want to... I wanna, I want it to be found, you know, whatever. Uh, and so we, we get anxious about those things. But, you know, have you ever lost something of great value? You ever lost something of great value? The parables we're going to read today in, in Luke all talk about losing something. And God is going to share with us a message as he talks about losing the, this, the, this loss, about how they, how, how they have lost something. You know, see, because God takes great joy when someone, and, and great joy and satisfaction when, when someone comes to him with repentance. And so there's no joy when someone is out there living uh, this hypocritical, proud life, and they're too proud to admit their wickedness, and they never come to Christ. That is, there's no rejoicing in that. And so these next parables that we're going to read and go through today talk about God finding that lost and seeking and finding that lost. And so the first few verses here they're going to read kind of set the stage of what's happening here. So let's just dive right in in uh, verses 1 and 2, the parable of the lost sheep. He said, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners to eat with them. And so, so Jesus is there, he's sharing a meal, he is he's talking to sinners, uh, to tax collectors, and we know that they were hated people. Uh, in other words, these are people that were actively living a life of sin, actively sinning, outwardly sinning. People saw it and they didn't care, they were, they were actively sinning. Tax collectors were known for, uh, for, for cheating people out of money. Uh, and so the Pharisees see this and say, look, this man welcomes sinners, this man eats with sinners, he fellowships with with sinners, uh, they didn't show any grace to sinners at all, and so and they resented Jesus because he was showing them grace because he was doing so, and so they so so they threw out this 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 thought that he he receives sinners and he socializes with sinners and eats with them. So Jesus, you know, was 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 he was not like the Pharisees. He was full of grace, and so Jesus was intentional in his. 
talking. Aren't we glad that he is intentional? He's intentional in, in, in the Bible of who he talks to and what he does. And he was intentional in talking to these sinners because he was offering them spiritual hope He was and help and blessing. And Jesus began to talk to them and, and, and specifically to the tax collectors and the sinners. Why? Because they needed Jesus. They needed to repent. They needed forgiveness. And then, so Jesus responds in these three parables to the Pharisees and these scribes and teachers that were not showing any kind of grace to these sinners. So let's pick up in verse 3. It says, Then Jesus told this parable, Suppose one of you, one of you has a hundred sheep but loses one. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in an open field and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he, hopefully, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. You know, we know, we know that sheep aren't the brightest animals in the world. And a lot of times, I, th- I guess that's why they, uh, the Scripture, uh, you know, kind of gives that imagery in, in regards to us. Because a lot of times, we're not always the brightest thing in the world. We, we veer off the path. And in the same way with, with a sheep, they will, they, will, they, will get it, they will go astray. They'll leave the pack and put themselves in harm's way. Um, we do that as well as believers, don't we? Um, but there is, there's, a, there's a picture here that, 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 that uh, this, this sheep is leaving there, and, and, and we do the same thing as we, get, we stray away from, from God and, and we get into this lost spiritual condition. Um, but see, the, the, poor, the poor sheep here was probably exhausted. He was wandering around. He was exhausted from exposure and probably hunger, and he was away from the pack in harm's way. And see, the shepherd, he didn't mind going the extra mile. He didn't mind going out and seeking that one sheep. It was not a burden for him to go and take that journey. So he goes the extra mile to to find this this lost lamb. And when he finds him, what does he do? He puts him on his shoulders and he rejoices that he found him. He He doesn't just rejoice, but he calls his friends together and say, hey, you know, I have found my lost sheep. And, they, and they, they celebrate because they have found, <coughs> excuse me, because he has found that lost lamb. So there's a few things that are happening here that we're going to talk about. Here the Lord is the picture of the shepherd. The shepherd is the picture of the Lord, excuse me. And the 99 sheep are representing the scribes and the Pharisees or maybe even the church. And the lost sheep represents the tax collectors and the sinners, or that backslidden believer. You know, uh, um, uh, you know we, could, we could look at this story and we, and we could say, well, what about the 99? And we can get tied up in, what, what about the 99? You're just going to leave them out in the open field, and, and are, are, they, are they safe? Um, and I don't think this parable is supposed to be read that way. We're, the, the main point is the lost sheep. And so if we concentrate on the 99, we're kind of losing the whole point of what God is trying to say. See, the 99 were supposed to represent the people that knew Christ, that knew the, the, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and, and in reality, though, if, they, if, if someone had 99 sheep, they would probably leave somebody with them to watch them as he went off and searched for the one. But we can't get tied, don't get tied up in that part. We need, we need to, to really concentrate on the fact that this shepherd went and found that lost one. Uh, and so we read that uh, we read um, that the shepherd seeks and pursues that lost sheep. Um, so he goes, he goes out of his way. He doesn't wait around for something bad to happen. He doesn't wait around for, for uh, the tragedy to strike, but he seeks out this lost lamb. He goes out and he finds him. He pursues him and he brings him back to safety. And that's what the, that's, that's what the picture we see here. This is a great picture of what Christ has done for us, because Christ goes to great lengths to get our attention, doesn't he? He shows us all, all that it shows us all that he loves us, that he cares for us. He goes out of his way to pursue us, to find us, to call us back into his arms, out of harm's way and into safety. That's our Lord. He does that for us. What did his journey look like? Well, his journey was a tough journey. He didn't mind doing it. He did it willingly. But, it, it, you know, to find the lost, he, he, he descended from heaven above and came to this earth, had a public ministry. He faced rejection and suffering and ultimately death for you and for me so that we could have salvation. 
So it's how true are the lines of the old hymn called the 99. It says this. It says, none of, none of the ransomed ever knew how deep the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. He went the extra mile to find his sheep. And the next verse right here is, probably, is, 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 is where we celebrate. In verse 7, it says, I tell you that there, in the same way that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people persons who, who do not need to repent. Um, there's a party going on in heaven when someone receives Christ. I love to tell that to every new believer. When I, when I get the chance to share Christ with someone, I get to look at them right in the eye and say, do you know that there's a party in heaven going on for you? For just you. There's a party going on in heaven because you were lost, but now you're found. And so there's much rejoicing. It pleases our Lord. It gives him joy, fills him with joy, and he, so he rejoices. And all of heaven with him. The next, the next parable is very similar to that parable, but slightly different. In verse 8, let's go ahead and read through that. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully to find it? And when she finds it, she, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found this lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels, the angels of God, over one sinner who has repented. Uh, this woman in the parable, you can kind of envision this woman who, who probably didn't have a whole lot. She had ten coins, but she loses one. And she loses that. That, that coin is no longer valuable to her if it's lost. So she, she, she needs that coin and she, she wants to find it. So she looks all around her house to find this coin. I think it's important to stop for a second and just think about this. Uh, this coin was lost at home. It wasn't lost out in public or out you know, uh, shopping. It was lost in her home. Um, you know, people are, you know, when we, when we think of lost people and people who are, who are falling into sin, we do not typically think of the home setting or the church setting. Um, but this, this coin was lost at home. Sometimes we grow up in church, or you may grow up in a godly home, and somehow you're still lost. Somehow you've fallen through the cracks. Maybe you had a bad church experience. Maybe you were taught bad theology. Maybe you just got hurt really bad. I don't know. But people uh, can be living in sin. People can be living as a, as a lost person and still be a part of a church and still be a part of a family, a godly family. And I think, obviously, you know, we have a, we have a greater advantage of knowing God if we are a part of a godly home or a part of a, a church. But this illustrates that even in good environments, people can still be lost. That means that we need to be on our game. That means that we still need to be sharing the love of Christ to everyone because we don't know what the next person beside you is going through or what their heart, what their heart condition is um, between them and God. We don't know. So what does the woman do? The woman continues to search carefully until she finds it. She lights a lamp, which would cost, would cost her some money to light a lamp, put oil in a lamp and, and to light it. And she searches the whole house carefully. This illustrates that this sinner is likened to this valuable coin that was lost. And the woman doesn't take this, this lax attitude where, oh, I'll just, you know, maybe I'll find it, maybe. No, she, she searches a great deal for this lost coin. So she lights the lamp, and she, gl- she doesn't just glance around the room with the, it looking for the coin, but she gets a broom out, and she, she, she gets all the corners and sweeps them all to the middle so she can find this lost coin because the coin was valuable. And so she must find it. How, do we, how does this apply to us? Well, as a sinner, when we humbly come to Christ and we confess our sins to Christ, he is overjoyed. He is overjoyed. Why? Because we, have, we are of great value to our Lord. And I hope you're so thankful. For, I hope you know that. Jesus wants the religious leaders. He was pointing to, he, these were pointed to the religious leaders because he wanted them to know how much the sinner meant to him 
how much these lost peoples meant to him. They're not just out there wandering. No, the the Lord is seeking them, is pursuing them, drawing them to himself. They're not just floating around out there pointlessly and aimlessly. God longs for that relationship, so he took the ultimate action. What was that action? He sent his only son to die on a cross for you and for me to restore that relationship, to bring us back to him, to reconcile us back to himself. So he goes to great means to pursue us and to bring us, just like this woman did to find this coin. And the third parable, we know this as the prodigal son. Pastor Melvin mentioned it last week briefly, uh, but there are so many, so many things that we could talk about in this scripture. Let's just dive right in. It says, Jesus continued. He said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one and, and his, uh, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me your share of your estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger man got together all that he had and went off to a different country and squandered his wealth away with wild living. After he had spent everything there, there was a severe famine over the whole country, and he began to be in need. So they went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country, and he sent him out to the fields to feed the pigs, and he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs uh, were eating but no one would give him any. So the, the father here in this, in this parable represents, of course, our heavenly father. The younger son represents the sinner, and the older son represents those Pharisees and those teachers and the church. <clears throat> it, it is pretty fair to say that this younger son was being kind of reckless. He was reckless in what he was asking for. He was, at, he was reckless in how he treated his father. Um, the son became kind of weary of, uh, of farming or, or working the land, and he didn't want to do it any longer. I don't know if there was some disgruntlement there. I, I don't know how. It doesn't really give any detail there, but he did not want to be there any longer. And so he pretty much says, you know, he goes to his father and says, you know, you, you know I'm not gonna, I don't want to wait for you to die, so uh, could you just, can I just have my portion so I can leave? And, and you know, you won't, you won't ever see me again. You won't hear from me again. I just... I just, can I just have what's mine? Can you imagine that? When do you get an inheritance? You get an inheritance when someone passes away. And, and so this son pretty much tells him, you know, I just wish you would die so that I could have what is mine. I just wish that you would die so that I could have my inheritance. And the way they were, uh, that inheritance works back in these days, the older son would get a double portion and then the younger son would just get the third. And so... What did the father do? Surprisingly, he, he, he divided it up, and he gave him his third, his portion, his equal portion, and then, and, then he, and, then he, and then he left, and he left. He packed his stuff up and went to a distant country. As we read here that he squandered it away with wild living. Of course, then he wasn't expecting the famine to hit and the depression to hit. So when it did, all of a sudden he had spent all his money and there was no employment. So he found himself feeding the pigs, which for a Hebrew boy, a Jewish boy, back in these days, that was disgraceful because that was probably a Gentile that that hired him out and then he was feeding this unclean animal. And so this was a disgrace for him to do that. But something happened in that moment. Something happened in that moment as he was sitting there in the mud looking at the pigs, longing for what they were eating, which is disgusting. He says, man, my father's house, the servants, they are treated so much better. They have food to spare. And so why don't I just go back home? I can just go back home and I'll tell my father that that I can be his servant. They are treated better than I am being treated. I think it's worth stopping for a second there and just thinking about why do we wait till we're face down in the mud before we come to our senses sometimes? Before we realize that our Heavenly Father has the best for us? Why do we wait till we're face down in the mud feeding the pigs, longing for the slop that the pigs are eating before we realize that God loves us and He just wants us to come home? That's what happens. See, see uh, the... the the, this young man didn't realize he, that, he was, that he was wrong when he was 
asking his father for his inheritance, that he was being disrespectful. He didn't, he didn't realize it when he was squandering away all of this money that his father had worked for his whole life so that he could have the best possible life. He didn't, he didn't even think nothing of it. He only thought about his error when he was face down in the mud. Why do we wait that long? But then he says he came to his senses. In verse 17, when he came to his senses, how many, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against the heavenly father, against the heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like the one, uh, one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. See, the, the famine was probably a blessing because it, it woke him up. It got his attention. And God used that to, to make him think. So, it, you know, it's hard to go through times like this in our life. It's hard to watch people go through times like this where you know that they're really screwing up and there's nothing that you can do about it. And it's hard to sit back and watch and, and, and pray for them. Uh, but there's sometimes that, that, that we can do some things but there's sometimes that we can't do anything to fix the situation. We just got to let it take its course and let them realize that Christ is their only hope. He alone can change situations. He alone ha- is the hope of forgiveness. And he offers that forgiveness to all, everyone when we come to him in repentance. And then we see the greatest part of this, this passage is the reunion that it happens so we continue on in verse 20. It says, But meanwhile, they were st- he was still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring my robe Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and his sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let the feast. Let us have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is now alive. He is lost, but now he is found. So they began to celebrate. I love this part because the father sees him from a from a long ways off. He knew that was his son. He knew that was his walk, and so he takes off running towards his son. It was almost if he was always looking for him, that he was always waiting for him to come back. He probably knew that, yeah, he probably done messed up. He probably done spent all the wealth that he had, but he still ran to him. Probably this was an unrespected thing to do. This was not a, a thing that an older man of wealth would do, especially run to their son who had just disgraced their family. He would not do that. But he took off running. He took off running towards his son, And his son had his little speech prepared saying, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm no longer worthy. Hire me as your servant. But I love the father's response. Because he says, you're not my hired servant. You're not my hired hand. You're my son and I love you. He put, he said, grab grab my best robe, put it on him. Put this ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet and grab the calf because we're going to kill it and celebrate today. Those are all things that are reestablishing his sonship back into the family. He accepts him back into the family. He didn't meet him with a lecture. He didn't meet him with, a, I told you so, but he met him with, I love you, welcome home. Jesus does not wait around for that shamed child to come timidly walking back, but he's running to us. He's, he's longing for us to come back to him. And he gathers us up those shamed, ragged, muddied self that we are, and he welcomes us back into his loving arms. Our Heavenly Father is anxiously waiting for some of us in this room right now to come back to Christ, to come back. He's not waiting with a guilt trip. He's not going to lecture you. He's not embarrassed of you, He's lo- but he loves you. The debt's already paid, and your only hope is in Christ, so come to Christ. Go to him. Put your trust in him. And then we see the the older son, which represents the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what is going on? And the brother came and and he replied, uh, replied, and and your father, 
uh, your brother came home, it has come, he replied, and the father has killed the fattened calf because he has back safe and sound. The older brother came angrily, refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have slaved for you. I've never been disobedient to your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. But, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitution has come, come home, you kill the fattened calf and come home. But then the father says this, my son, the father said, you are all, always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother, this brother of yours was dead and is now alive. He was lost, but now he is found. When the older son got wind of this, he was jealous, he was angry. because Why? Because he had been faithful to, to his father for all these years. He had, he had never asked for anything. He had just done, been obedient, and yet they've never celebrated those things, according to him. And when confronted, he started whimpering. You know, hey, I, I've, I've done all these things, and I don't get a celebration. You don't kill the fattened calf for me. The older son is a picture of the scribes. They, they resented God for showing grace to the sinner. Why? Because they thought they deserved that grace. They thought they deserved the celebration. I've been faithful. I've done all these things. I've preached. I've done this. I've, I've, I've prayed, you know, whatever. And, then, and, they, and they, they said, I deserve all that celebration. They don't deserve that celebration. They're just a bunch of sinners. They're just a bunch of, you know, uh, you know they, the Gentiles that go out and, and they do whatever they want. They live it up. But we are the faithful, we are the scribes, the teachers of the word, right? Their pride had blinded them to the fact that God had lavished so much blessing on them already. They didn't even see it because of their pride. There's an author named Bob Goff. Uh, He writes a book called Everybody Always. Uh, And he has a great example of this very, very thing we're talking about. And he calls it tickets. Uh, You know, and and so if you go to uh, Chuck E. Cheese, everybody loves Chuck E. Cheese, right? It's torture, guys. Don't lie. No, <laughs> kids love Chuck E. Cheese. You go to Chuck E. Cheese, uh, or you can go to uh, you know any any kind of um, you know skating rings or or any kind of place like that, and you can uh, and you can play games and win tickets. And you win tickets. What kids will do a lot of times is they'll save up all these tickets, right? You want to get as many tickets as you can. Sometimes. They'll take them home and come back the next time and add more tickets to it, right? So they could go to the, the prize counter and put all these tickets on there and they could get the biggest prize, right? But what happens a lot of times is you come up short a little bit, right? Um, but we bring all our tickets. And Bob Goff says he saved like 1,000 tickets one time. He's like, man, I'm going to get the big teddy bear, right? Or whatever. So he goes to the counter, he puts all the tickets on there, and he came away with a big oversized pencil right? It didn't even have an eraser on it because that was an extra $500, 500 tickets. Um, You know, and he relates that to our walk with Christ because how many times are we out there getting tickets for Christ? We, you know, with our accomplishments, we're, we're trying to get tickets. Well, I've got this degree. I've got this accomplishment. I've done all these good deeds and we're just collecting tickets. We're collecting tickets. I've, I've done all these things and for in your name, I've been faithful. So we're just collecting these tickets, hoping that, God, that we would got, gain God's favor and be able to trade up with God for his grace. But see, God's not interested in all of those things that you did. He's interested in your heart condition, a repented heart. That's, what's, what, that's what matters to him. You can, God's grace is not something you trade for good deeds. It's given to you. It's not something that we earn at all. And so no matter how many tickets you got, that God's grace is free. Why? Because he loves you. He's interested in that humble, repentive heart. And if you just come to him with that humble, repentive heart, he's going to welcome you. He's going to kill the fattened calf, put a robe on you because he loves you. And the last point for today is what do we do now? For believers, what do we do? Hopefully you found yourself in this story somewhere. But here's the, here's the thing. This scripture is on the front of your bullet, and it says, Be prepared. <clears throat> because the only hope that we have is in Christ. First Peter 3.15 says this. 
But in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that, is, that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This applies to all Christians, to all believers, all followers of Christ. We know the price that Christ has paid for us. We know what he has done for us. We know that there's no way that we can earn it. There's no way that, that we're worthy of it. It's just freely given. We know that the, so that the only hope that we ha- have is in Christ, is in Christ and his finished work on the, Christ, on the cross. So therefore, because we have this consciousness of what Christ has done for us, that should give us the boldness to go out and share that hope with other people. That should inspire us to share that hope with the people that we care about most, with the people that we come in contact with, with those sinners that it's talking about in this, in this passage. We need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in us. I hope that's you. I hope you can do that this morning. And not just, not just be ready, but looking for opportunities to give hope to those people. So last of all, you know, we went over a lot, a lot. We went over a lot here. To the unbeliever out there, to the sinner who is out there, God is seeking you out with great cost. He went to the cross for you. He sent his only son for you. And he is still longing for you to restore that relationship, to come to him so that that relationship will be restored and he can give you rest if you will just be obedient to come to him with that repentive heart. He is anxiously waiting and longing for you. And for the believer out there, are you ready? Are you ready in every opportunity to give an account for the hope that is in your heart? Are we ready? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, God. We thank you so much for for who you are, for what you've done for us, Lord, for the hope that you give us. Lord, um, I just pray that you would uh, just um, be in our presence here in the next few moments, Lord. And if there's someone in here that doesn't know you, that they would come forward and for the very first time meet you in a, in a very genuine and real way and know that hope that you give us. Uh, Lord, we, we, just, um, we just thank you for that, Lord. We don't deserve it. We've done nothing to earn it. Uh, we don't have enough tickets to buy it. Lord, but you give it to us freely, Lord, and we thank you so much, God, and uh, just help us to be faithful and obedient and sharing that hope with the world. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.